Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Sianibuli sanam sanje, sanam kela apa, a cornerstone. Pagati we tu sano president, we tu u Mr. Professor John Volmink, Marcel Golding, and our CEO. Thank you for joining us. We have Professor Volmink, Marcel Golding, and our CEO. I'm your host tonight, Kamalam Nabagazi Nugwana. And I would like to ask our president, John Foaming, to open for us. Uh, by virtue of the authority vested in me, I hereby constitute this gathering as a gathering of Cornerstone Institute Senate. Thank you. I would like to call up our saxophone performance, who will give us a rendition of the anthem. We will not sing the anthem, we will sing the anthem at the end. And in this rendition, we will take it as a meditation. Thank you. Thank you. I call upon our CEO, Mr. Noel Daniels, to introduce our executive dean, who is being inaugurated today. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the special sitting of Senate, where we will be inaugurating our executive dean this evening. It certainly is a very proud moment for me as the CEO of Cornerstone Institute, and I, of course, work very closely with the Reverend Dr. Rudy Bass on a daily basis, and to be able to celebrate this occasion with you is indeed an auspicious occasion. I'd really like to welcome all of you, um, and so will not necessarily be singling out any individuals, um, other than at this stage, to introduce you to the Reverend Dr. Rudy Bass. Dr. Bass joined Cornerstone Institute in 2017 following the completion of his doctoral studies as a full-time student locally and abroad. His prior role before joining Cornerstone includes having been and served as the Dean of Student Affairs at Free State University from 2010 to 2014. He also served as the Provincial Youth Commissioner tasked with education from 2005 to 2009. These are two mere minor, relatively minor milestones um, in, in Rudy's very outstanding career. And I think to, today marks yet another one of those milestones. 
Just to give you a little bit more insight into Rudy's work, Rudy specialized to master's level in public theology with a focus on community engagement. His dissertation dealt with the practice of holistic communication and language theory, drawing theoretically on the work of Leonardo Boff, Jürgen Moltmann, and Ludwig Wittgenstein, among others. Professor Kali August and Professor Johann Seliers at Stellenbosch University supervised successive dissertations. In his doctoral work, Rudy really focused on higher education studies with a focus on change theory. He completed the qualitative study in 2015 as a visiting scholar at the University of California in Los Angeles. And the dissertation last year, supervised by Professor John, Jonathan Jansen at the University of the Free State. The study theoretically draws on the work of Paulo Freer. He will proudly announce that he is a Freerian. Homi Baba, Donald Winnicott, and Rene Girard, amongst others. Rudy has completed his publication, uh, the Afrikaans, which sometimes referred to Kapsa publication, um, entitled Brick Powers, um, which he launched at Cornerstone Institute last year as well. It indeed is a great moment for me to now call the Reverend Dr. Rudy Bass onto the stage so that he can be formally inaugurated as the Executive Dean of Cornerstone Institute. Rudy, please come and join us. Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you very much um, colleagues, uh, you know, everyone here. Yeah, I really appreciate it and thank you for coming. So many friends and colleagues here yeah, um, and it's really, it means a lot to walk through here yeah, and meet with everyone and you've all played such an important role in my life you don't even realize it. So thank you very much for being here. So I arrive here as an experienced young man now. About seven years ago, I was ordained as a Dutch Reformed minister in a small congregation in Lukov, in the southern Free State. And as part of this, uh, this uh, liturgy, you have to kneel in, in, the, in the middle of, you know, in front of the pulpit on your knees, both knees, and then all the reverends and the past ministers from, from the area come and they put their hands on you and then they pray for you. And of course, this happens with me as well. And the problem with kneeling with, on both knees is that your feet then, you know, faces upward. Your soles faces upward. And the previous day, I had gotten myself some new shoes. <laughs> I'll have you know at a special, at a sale, 50% off. <laughs> I was so happy. So the thing I forgot was to actually remove the big red sticker the back of one of the souls. <laughs> so that blessing went down with, you know, everyone trying to keep a straight face. I was the butt of every joke for the few months in that, in that area. Tonight, no new shoes. 
just every day who we are and what we think. So thank you very much for being here. What makes hope? When debates on the ghosts of our fraught past revisits us in new debates on apartheid symbols. When commissions of inquiry into state capture abound with ever-increasing um, revelations of decay. When the economy grounds to a halt. When a woman student is murdered and raped at a post office. When mayhem seems the only headline, what hope do we speak of? How do we reconstruct hope when our aspirations fail to recapture the half-forgotten dream of a restored nation? Is hope not more than a thing, more than a private or a public good to work for, more than projects of economic growth, more than the outcome of a set of circumstances, more than a belief or an attitude, more than symbolic representation, social imaginary or political rhetoric? Is hope not rather a face, a voice, a body, a togetherness? Hope as an embodiment of our being human, our lived experiences that take shape when people from vastly different realities are near each other, see and hear each other, reach out and embrace and embrace the other. Hope as the connectedness and proximities, the shared vulnerabilities, the new solidarities that we each hold together with those who on the face of it are most different from us. Hope as a relational reality. Hope I submit is a who and a who with. We accept that it is actual, if we accept that it is um, in the actual relationships of different people from diverse lives, that they live amongst the complexities of society, evident transition. If we accept that that determines hope, what then is the social good? Is the social good a realized sense of national cohesion, a collective sense of resilience that citizens draw on to overcome similar struggles in very different realities? Is the social good not more than the best interest of society at large? More than the private good of its citizens, more than the public good of the collective, even more than a resilient democracy that ensures basic rights and freedoms are realized. Is the social good not rather not a good at all, but a deeply rooted sense that we are capable to reflect and act? Human agency as the social good, as a sense of self, of others, and the world that persuades of our, of our inherent authority to triumph over our failures. Agency to reimagine and enact a hope, a togetherness. I hope that draws us nearer to one another when our fears would drive us apart. Citizen agency as a way of being, of knowing, and doing. Or in meta-theoretical terms, if you'll allow me, an ontology, an epistemology, and a methodology of change. Agency, I submit, is the socially good and the social good we yearn for. If we accept that hope and the social good is uh, relational, embodied and best represented in the lived realities of citizen agency, then it follows that the theater where the struggle to prosper plays out must be our daily lives. Our lives scarred with how disconnected we are, scarred by the social distances we all live with, in act, and of course also protest the societal hierarchies that permeate all aspects of South African life. This is the first interpretive frame I propose we use to consider the possibility of hope, the social good, and higher education, the lived reality of social hierarchies. 
Hierarchies determine some to be powerful and others to be powerless. It determines the struggle to shift positions on that continuum. It promises mobility, but it only offers suspicion. The powerful must protect its power and the powerless must gain or disrupt it. The binaries that leave everyone a perpetual suspect. That is where we find ourselves, having to negotiate our positions and positionalities. However, in between the places we must each negotiate, there is a positionality that seeks to disrupt the established order, to break new ground, to build a new imaginary that sets citizen agency as its goal. That is the space of the prophet. In between, with new knowledge, new identities, and new energy to enact hope and the social good. Do private higher education as an arena of knowledge, in actual fact, in our nation, intersect with this hope, this social good? And if so, how? In what ways do higher education respond to a relational view of hope and the social good? What place does agency have in the social and corporate architecture of private higher education? Does higher education conform to the established hierarchies of society of powerful and the powerless to be the suspect? Or are there instances of a prophet, a renegade driving at a new imaginary? This then is the question I raise also in my title. Is private higher education the suspect or a prophet? Two considerations make this question of private higher education and the public good, the social good, an urgent one. First, a persistent, a persistent ambivalence regarding private higher education in higher education policy, a protectionist engagement with the sector by public authorities, and declarations by political actors such as that private, racial and class bias determine the interests of the sector. And secondly, what is considered an explosive growth, an explosive growth of higher education mainly for private benefit as a sector of the economy. Political and governmental regard of private higher education during the first decade of democracy were initially very positive as the sector was considered a partner for the expansion and massification of access, of higher education access, such as with partnerships between public and private institutions to offer combined qualifications. However, in the latter part of the decade, in the early 2000s, the emphasis shifted to suspicion to my mind due to concerns for the quality of education offered by the sector the fly-by-nights argument, for the impact, the risk um, that the impact of the growing private sector held for the sustainability of public institutions, and due to the private institution's commitment to and contribution to the public good, the suspicions of private higher education centered on these themes. The subsequent decade, the last 10 years or so, in the main focused on increasing regulation of private provisioning and entrenched the divide between public and private with all public funds, for instance, for student fees um, and funds for scholarly research directed only to public institutions. However, over the past years, increasing effectivity of quality control systems and oversight of SACWA, the Department and the Council for Higher Education and greater responsiveness to oversight by private higher education institutions improved the relationship of the private sector and, and public authorities. A second shift is emerging following the first to more control. A second shift is emerging <clears throat> that promises a return to the initial appreciation of private higher education as a partner in transformation of society in general and higher education in particular. You may remember that the, amend the Amendment Act of 2016 actually 
um, made provision that, that private institutions can be registered as universities by the name. At the moment, all private institutions, if you're not aware, uh, can only be called um, uh, private higher education institutions as a formal name. So it's a big thing in actual fact. It was a great shift that he presented in that amendment act. All right. This shift arguably results from two factors, namely the difficulties public higher education faces to respond to societal demands, as well as the progress of private higher education as a mature, maturely managed and governed sector. Higher, educa higher education in general, um, and public institutions in particular, face an increasing realization that we've achieved insufficient progress in transforming the sector. In the main, as represented in the funding crisis of public higher education and the slow pace of institutional transformation, institutional cultures, the diversity of the professoriate, and decolonial curriculum. In addition to increasing numbers and diverse corporate models of private education institutions, various mixes of contact and acquisitions and so forth, private institutions increasingly struggle to position themselves in relation to public institutions in terms of scholarship and institutional identities. So, for instance, the fact that private institutions may not as yet be registered or recognized as fully-fledged universities does not in any way diminish that private institutions specialize in teaching and learning, research, and community engagement, which is the main requirements to be considered an institution. Still, even though private institutions would associate and identify as fully-fledged institutions, the policy limits actually prohibit the flow of research funding and you know, uh, student funding to private institutions. And what that causes is very simply that the private sector struggle to actually recruit senior scholars and major research grants. And so the sector loses the opportunity to contribute to a knowledge project within the country. Whereas the argument for higher education as a public good is uncontested, as is the right to private education, how the sector engages the tension between public and private goods remain, remains in flux. Diverse institutions in mission and program offering locate themselves, again on a continuum of priority commitment to the public good on the one hand, and priority, and priority commitments to share price on the other. As represented in nonprofits in the sector and a set of corporate models um, uh, on the other. The sector must deal also with the second tension, that of being closer or more distant in engagement with higher education policy and curriculum discourses such as the major debate on decolonizing knowledge and curriculum. The private sector, for instance, has limited, limited representative bodies that mediate contributions to national policy. It is a sparsely organized sector. And in reality, the sector at best has a lackluster uptake of the project to decolonize curriculum. Its emphasis seemingly remains on curriculum in service of market demands rather than curriculum in service of social transformation. Using the notion of social hierarchy to make sense of the place and the future of private higher education, I conclude that the sector finds itself at the margins of higher education, the place of the suspect other. This is not only because public policy and the need for expansion and massification foregrounded public education, it also seems that private providers have played to the suspicions held by the broader higher education community that it engages only for singular private interest, a role as a suspect that private higher education in general adopted, continues to enact and struggle to break free from. To be fair, entrenched social hierarchies disallow those at the center and those at the margins to construct any other role than what the hierarchy determines. At the center, one must fight to retain your power, and at the margin, you have little option but to conform to the landscape to survive. 
The muscle movements arguably represent the mirror that reveals this dynamic in higher education. However, irrespective of being at the center or the margin, what defines your thinking and doing is what the hierarchy decides. A directive from outside of yourself to determine who you think you are, what you think you know, and what you think you are capable of or not. However, social hierarchy enacted in the lived experience of our people make for only half the story. If our daily lives create the theater where the struggle for hope and the social good plays out, then its the backdrop, then its backdrop is painted by the transitions of an emerging society or transitionality as a second interpretive frame I propose we use to explore who we are, suspects or prophets. As a rule, theories of change locate societies in transition on a pathway from a past to a future. The present as a temporary location fraught with struggles to break free from the past and realize an Im imagined future. In the same way as the landing in between two staircases that lead from one floor to the next in a high-rise building is only a temporary stay, societies in transition are considered in a temporary moment en route to somewhere else. This means that what we think and do at that landing remains determined by the flaws you come from and head to. It has less meaning in itself. In such a space, the social imaginary holds sway over both the floor I come from and the floor I go to. So when you're in this spot in between two floors, this landing in the middle, where you go to and where you come from is determined by where you come from and where you think you're going, not by the space where you're at. And therefore, what determines how you think in that space is your, your memory and your imagination of where you come from and where you want to go. What it does is it draws you away from where you're at. It, it leaves you to live in, in the imaginary. Of course, this is what we're very good with as South Africans, is that social imaginary and to contest that. The rea this reality makes the in-between space a transitional space with its own structure, its own demands, and its own hopes. Such as our society, a transitional space in between where our shared imaginary of our future is largely based on a contested imaginary of where we come from and where we're at, and on its underlying architecture, its social architecture. What a transitional space offers us is the never-ending option to reimagine. It's an option. The understanding that we are not our past, but that much of our past remains our present. That we are not our future, but that much of what we imagine for our future is already present. And that we are the authors of the twists and turns of that storyline of a nation. It is in the transitional spaces that citizens discover their agency. This is so because transitional spaces lead people to particular ways of being, knowing, and doing. In-betweenness defines who we are. A sense of self that yearns to meet the stranger, discover unfamiliar worlds, and embrace the unfamiliar. A community of strangers and bridge boulders that represent a new togetherness, a new way of knowing that counters hierarchy, seeks new designs, and translates meaning for a society facing the residues of past injustice. A continuous struggle with ambiguity, contradiction, and complexity, fluidity of meaning that requires a society to reinvent itself without pause. A new way of doing change, 
of doing change that invites difference, reaches across divides to build solidarities, that uncovers what lies hidden, that struggles not to avoid the past but to drive through our imaginaries of its legacy to reconstruct hope and the social good. The struggle of transitionality for me remains best illustrated in the Talking Heads, a cover of a Pink Floyd album. So if you just take the program, uh, you, you know, if, if you don't mind, you know, take the program and look, there's a picture at the, at the back of the program. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of my most favorite images ever. But it's, uh, it's the album cover of, of uh, an album by Pink Floyd called Division Bell. I think it's a 1994, if I, if I have it right. I, no, no, it's later. Me? I can't remember. Skulk, you may know. <laughs> so, um, but what is amazing about this, this is actually a picture of, of two statues in a field. Um, and, and the two statues face one another, as you can see. Um, as, as, you know, it symbolizes communication, conflict, debate, engagement, and so forth. So you'll see that the, that the two faces, you know, the, they face each other. But if you, if you look at the picture, then you'll see that the two eyes, you know, that face each other become two eyes that look at you. The, the, the two noses become one nose facing you. The two mouths become a mouth that faces you. Do you see it? Well, I struggled, but okay. Um, <laughs> and so what this shows is that there's a third face present there. There's a third face just hidden. And, and it's when you, when you begin to see it, then that third face is always present. But you never really see it. You just know it's there. You're aware of it. And as the light you know, would, would, you know, would shine differently and there would be new angles on these two statues, you will see different sides of this third face. And so that is transitionality. That's an illustration of, of being in transition, that there's these two worlds, these two opposites still engaging and struggling, but there's this third face, something new, something different emerging through all of this. Through the opti optical delusion, the third face of transitionality is at once there and not there. As the sunlight on the sculptures in the field changes over time, different parts of the heads are highlighted. Every day offers new perspectives. All three are always there without pause, present, seen and not seen, definitive and not, different ways of being, knowing and doing. This is precisely what transitional societies make possible, an underlying new knowledge that struggles to emerge and thereby offers direction to higher education as a performance of hope and the social good. Its positionality in between the opposites, the positionality of higher education, private higher education, the opposites of the established hierarchies of higher education offers private higher education the opportunity to uncover and embolden new communities of togetherness and design. Its shape allows for, inter for the integration of citizen agency as a practice of knowledge and a theme in curriculum. Its proximity to established academic hierarchies and the corresponding identities and commitments to academic governance and deep learning enables private higher education to reshape the landscape by redefining its sense of self and place. The sector will run free when it takes hold of its underlying third positionality, not to yearn for the center or respond to the winds at the margins, but to become a driver of change, the profit status of in-betweenness. In order to do so, the sector must lead its own way to build a new scholarship that is responsive to a continent's need to recast itself. A nation's need to hear new voices and see different faces, and a sector's need to find its agency in a landscape fraught with the remnants of power 
and hierarchy. Agency enacted through combined voices and focused reflective practice. Agency as it emerges from intentional enactment of hope as a social good of a transitional society. For our part, as Cornerstone, we hope to build a third voice by strengthening scholarship on and for the sector. So, just also on the program, just above the, the Pink Floyd picture, there's a, we thought to include, just for your notice, um, we're starting our first scholarly journal uh, as Cornerstone, uh, the African Journal for Nonprofit Higher Education, with a specific focus for scholarship on, on, on the sector. And the first uh, edition to be published next year, June. Uh, where's our journal manager over there, Emily? Um, and for our part, we hope to call our sector to build a policy voice through representative forums. Uh, we don't actually have a non-profit South African Higher Education Association, and, we, and we'll be calling on our, on our, on our, on our, uh, our fellow institutions to get us going in that. But most of all, we aim to engage the struggle for human becoming. We aim to teach our nation to embrace the stranger, to build citizens that reach across the divide, that uncover hidden worlds, and together design and construct futures beyond social hierarchies. And we aim to become prophets of agency, of hope, and a social good that matters. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. I would like to invite the Belham and Kales River Moravian Church Choir, directed by Dr. Crystal Janica, and they will bless us with two items.
I take this opportunity to invite our chair of the board, Mr. Marcel Golding, to give a response. Thank you, Chairperson. That's it? It's okay. Um, the last time I was asked to respond to an academic presentation was close on 40 years ago when I was in an honors class um, debating Polensis and uh, Gramsci and all of these sort of illustrious leaders of the working class. And uh, to now be asked to respond to an academic treatise that's been summarized in, I suppose, uh, 20 minutes is extremely difficult. But let me say that I've learned one thing about sort of my entire life is to um, uh, if you want to articulate a view, just say what you want to say. Uh, forget what someone else has said and just stick to the message. So, Rudy, I want to congratulate you on your inaugural lecture. I think it has uh, put the proverbial cat amongst the pigeons, so to speak, by raising some very important questions around what hope is, what the social good is, and the interaction between hope and social good in the context of higher education. How do we relate the achieving of transformation in the private higher education space, I think will be a perennial debate of whether the entire focus of people involved in higher education is to serve the public good, or whether they merely, or whether they are focused on promoting social good and not profit. I think there is a road that can be achieved where viability of private institutions can be promoted and at the same time serve the public good. What we are doing in Cornerstone Institute, I believe, is creating hope, creating togetherness, and promoting social good. We are promoting education, for social justice, and we're promoting education and learning in the service of our country and people. It is a journey that started 49 years ago, and next year we celebrate 50 years of Cornerstone's establishment. I think it has an illustrious provenance, and the generation that has taken up the baton to continue what it has done for the last 49 years I think is a great challenge for us. With the academic leadership, I think, Rudy, that you are hopefully going to give us at Cornerstone over the next 50 years, <laughs> prepares us, I think, for the challenges of the 21st century. With all those challenges we have in our country, it is our duty, I believe, to step up to the plate to serve, I think to change, I think to trans transform and inspire, and to give hope to those who still live in despair. Cornerstone Institute requires an academic courage, Rudy, and my hope is that your tenure will promote a togetherness and diversity and a non-racialism together with an intellectual rigor and a humility in the service of our community and our country. The calling of private higher education institutions requires that we forge a path to fill the gap in our country's education needs. I think it requires a resourcefulness, I think it requires ingenuity, and I think it requires a lot of creativity. Because we cannot expect to change our country if we use the same methods that we've used in the past. Things have changed, things have moved on, and yet things haven't changed. So the challenge for us to understand what has changed and what really hasn't changed 
so that we can bring about the fundamental change that promotes unity, diversity in the country. I'd like all of us present tonight to join us in this journey. Corner started, Cornerstone Institute started on the Cape Flats and is still very much rooted in the community. Its founding purpose remains true, that it's to educate so that we can serve our people, learn so that we can change the world and make it a better place. Rudy, if that is your guiding motto, I think Cornerstone will be well served with your academic leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. In closing, I'd like to thank you for your attendance, and I welcome you to and invite you to break bread with us and be with us. Right now, I would like for us to rise and sing the national anthem led by the Moravian Choir. By virtue of the authority vested in me, I hereby dissolve this gathering as a gathering of the Senate of Cornerstone Institute. Thank you. Thank you.